It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Wednesday, April 26th, your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high quality content that is going to dig into the Flyers Wayback Machine and compare top lines from the beginning of the season until the end of the season. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Yeah, plus we'll get to your mailbag questions all on today's show. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings. Uh, Thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen every day. I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here as always with Russ Cohen, who is on Twitter at Sportsology. This episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. You can subscribe or follow Locked On Flyers for free on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts to get our latest episode as soon as it's available here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Russ, before we dig into the Flyers' top line discussion, uh, just a quick update on the executive search. Uh, Emily Cassingay is apparently out of the consideration. Uh, she is definitely going back to Vancouver per Elliot Friedman. And, uh, you know, it would have been interesting, I think, to go in a different direction like this, but certainly understand uh, she was, you know, with Vancouver, I think, just for a year so far. So maybe she's got, you know, more to give there. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's one of those things you look around, you could better yourself by doing interviews. That's fine. Yeah, I think so. And uh, any other updates on that front? I mean, you hear the name Cammy Granado. I don't think it's going to happen here. I just. My gut feeling for here is is that they kind of know what Ray Shiro wants to do, whether he's interviewed or not. I haven't heard that he's actually interviewed, but I have a feeling he has been. And I think it's just a matter of what they do with 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 Danny. Like if Danny stays as GM, do they pay Shiro enough to take that hockey ops position instead of a GM position like I'm hearing that he wants? Or do they go and get somebody, you know, with lesser credentials that'll be easier to slide in? I just feel like that's the way it's going. And even though we had heard these other names and uh, it was good to hear them and and know about at least one interview definitively that um, I just didn't think they were going to go that way. Yeah, uh, it is kind of interesting. We're getting, you know, some new names, some, you know, traditional hockey men names in the conversation and you know the the flyers have been talking a lot about change and you know bringing something new to the table or you know large swaths of change and to go to traditional hockey men's i don't know if that's like the way to go about it but uh we'll see where it ends up you know it depends on your um definition of change rachel like like danny breer is a change but he's been here for a year if Alan McCauley gets the GM spot, like we think in Lehigh, he's been here a year. So, it, you know, is that real change? Like, that's what you, it depends on your definition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think so. All right. So, Russ, uh, we have been talking throughout the season behind the scenes. And I, you know, put a marker on the lineup for game one versus the New Jersey Devils and uh, pulled those lines and I said wouldn't it be fun at the end of the season to compare what the top line looked like at the beginning of the season to the end of the season and if it made any impact or if it shows any progress so today is the day that we are going to have that conversation and way back in October when the Flyers first started that that first game against the New Jersey Devils the top line was uh, Kevin Hayes centering Scott Lawton and Travis Konechny. And trying to think about how we felt about it at the time, I think we were still sort of in disappointment mode about Sean Couturier, that's for sure, and that uh, Kevin Hayes wasn't exactly the top-line center we thought we were getting this season. Uh, Is that, to the best of your recollection, what we were thinking? Yes. I I think that is, to 
what I was thinking. And I knew in my heart, Scott Lawton's not a top liner, but he was giving it his all. And Lawton and Konecki <coughs> did have a little something, but it was clear at some point that Hayes was not doing what the coach wanted to do. So this was going to be an ill-fated top line no matter what. Yeah, and uh, interestingly, that is exactly how it played out. So the most ice time those three got together all season was in that game, according to natural, <laughs> uh, according to natural stat trick. Uh, they played together. Now, whether it was Lawton at center and Hayes on the wing, um, you know, it's impossible to discern based yeah. on the data I have. But they got 116 game minutes together all season, nine goals for and. 10 goals against um, they did get a lot of scoring chances though. You know, if you look at their on ice play together, uh, 85 scoring chances for 37 against. So, you know, as a unit and this is expected looking at those personnel, especially with Scott Lawton out there. And if he was center for more of those minutes, uh, I think, you know, he is a defensively minded guy mm -hmm. and, and has that style of play. So that doesn't surprise me in terms of the ratio. No. of the scoring chances. But yeah, I think, you know, they definitely deserved more of a shot. Yeah, I think they did. I think in the end, it, it certainly would have served the team better. But again, you know, Torts can say whatever he wants, but after a while it became a little bit of he against Kevin Hayes for, I would say, a stretch of games. Yeah, I, I think that was the big part of it that um, I wouldn't say so at the beginning of the season, especially, you know, Hayes was pretty successful mm -hmm. on the score sheet uh, for the first half of the season. Obviously, that's partially no, why he got the All-Star game bid, you know? Yeah, but there was a point in the first half, even before the All-Star game, where it started to go south. Yes, I can't that tell is you true. exactly when, but... Yeah, it just wasn't like early in the season when right. these guys were put together in, in yes. that line. Um and I think also what was going on at that time is that, um, you know, Torch was trying to get used to the team. And also at that time, you know, I think Noah Cates was less of a, a known entity. Uh -huh. And there was a, a large, massive pile of doubt about Morgan Frost. And, and yeah. that's why it was sort of a default situation for Kevin Hayes to get that top, you know, 1C role. Yeah, I agree. So if you then fast forward quite a bit to the last game of the season, lo and behold, the top line still have Travis Konechny on it, but uh, it is centered by the aforementioned Morgan Frost and Joel Farabee is on the left wing. And um, I think, you know, if you look at the ups and downs of the season and the way things went, um, having that line be the top line at the end of the season makes perfect sense. Yeah, I think the way things worked out, I do think it makes sense. Uh, do I think that's the top line next year? Whenever you ask that question, I'll answer it. Yeah, that we'll talk about in the next segment. But, you know, I think in terms of where the team wound up at the end of the season, we saw the progression of Morgan Frost and his development into a real solid player that was a playmaker and a scorer. Um, unfortunately, because it took them so long to get there, that line, and because of Travis Konechny's injury, um, only got 80 minutes together. Um, and they weren't quite as successful in terms of the scoring chance ratio. But again, I think, you know, if you look at Farabee's play versus Lawton's play, they're just like, they're different kinds of players, right? And Konechny was never going to be like that kind of a, a guy to prevent scoring chances um, at five on five. You know, if you look at him, he did get that PK time. That's yeah. a little bit different. But I think, you know, this team, this line didn't really have as much time to gel. But I do see it as a line that could be impactful given more time. Yeah, I, I agree. Um... Unfortunately, with John Tortorella, <clears throat> it doesn't take much to break up lines. And that is something right. that has happened his whole career. He couldn't break up the line in Tampa with LeCavier Richards and um, – who am I leaving out? LeCavier Richards – oh, St. Louis. He couldn't break up that line. It was impossible because right. it was the best line in hockey. But everything else was always up for grabs. 
Yeah, exactly. So in our next segment, we are going to dig into what maybe the top line should be or could be and some other guys that got to dip their toes in the top line pool, so to speak. And we will do that coming up next. Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you'll have. My favorite part of the Game Time app is that it's great for getting notified about last-minute tickets and flash deals. Plus, you can get views from your seats. The Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. You'll find tickets in the same section and row for less. Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Also, tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to dig through your email. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. You can follow Locked On Flyers on Twitter and Instagram at Locked On Flyers. That is where you'll keep up to date on all our episodes. And if you want your mailbag questions answered, like we're doing in the next segment, you can email us at Locked On Flyers at Gmail, tweet us at Locked On Flyers, or comment over on YouTube. Russ, uh, we were just talking about the top line at the end of the season, which was Morgan Frost centering Joel Farabee and Travis Konechny. And uh, I, I do think they deserved a little bit more time. But again, it was very limited because of Travis Konechny's injury. And uh, in the absence of Travis Konechny, Owen Tippett was given a little bit of time on that top line. Yeah. And I, I think that that uh, Faraby Frost Tippett line uh, was also a, an interesting option. They wound up getting you know more minutes total, but um, I, I do think that ultimately with Konechny there, and you look at the data and goals for per sixty, right? The Faraby Frost Konechny was more successful, and this is all from Money Puck. Um, with 5.41 goals per 60, but Fairby Frost Tippett still pretty successful, 3.64 goals for per 60. And I do think that, you know, Owen Tippett and Travis Konechny, like th their DNA is similar, but how it presents itself is very different on the ice. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I think this has a chance to be the top line next year. It's got a chance. Uh, at least it's been vetted out to some degree. And mm -hmm. so I don't think the coaching staff would have that much of a problem with it. I don't think you should really ever put Tippett on the top line for a long stretch. So, you know, unless something unforeseen happens, that's probably, you know, pretty close to what your line's going to be. So, and I'm fine with that. I mean, at this point, for the type of team they're going to be next year, it's it's okay. Yeah. And, you know, we didn't see many other people get really a whiff at that top line Noah over Cates the course. A little bit, you know. Yeah. So we got Noah Cates at center for a little bit. Again, mostly when it was like covering for injuries. Right. Um, and so we saw Noah Cates centering Farabee and Konechny and Farabee and Tippett. So those wings stayed at the same as they were and uh you know with some mixed results now kate settering faraby and tippet um didn't get a ton of minutes only 65 minutes so it's kind of hard to uh judge that entirely but 6.43 goals for per 60 uh but they did also allow a lot of goals yeah it's <laughs> So uh, I'm not sure that's a combination that you want to keep together on that top line. But, you know, JVR took, you know, uh, some shifts on the top line, again, probably injury related. But I think that there's very little possibility for anything else for this next season, at least in terms of the top line. Now, if they end up trading Travis Konechny, does Owen Tippett get that top spot or does somebody else get an opportunity oh, yeah. in there? Yeah. That's a really interesting question, I think. Yeah, sure. I think that's 
you know, something you would pontificate. But I still, I still haven't seen enough to put Tippett on a top line, even of a developing team. Yeah, I, I do think, you know, the, the Flyers have a certain degree of depth at right wing, but I just, that is that is partially why I'm leaning toward tra- uh, not trading Travis Konechny, right? Because I just don't think you have somebody to put up top there. I think the depth is there, but they're yeah. all like middle six guys, right? Right, and I think that's a fair point. Um, the other thing is, you know, Allison's only got one more year, so... There's not stability with that, you know, and so I, I think, I think that's that's the issue. I think you're right. It's all middle six talent for now, um, and mm-hmm. as a result, yeah, he has to kind of stay there, you know, unless he gets traded. If he gets traded, then that's a whole different thing. Then maybe somebody you're getting in that trade goes there. Uh, even if Tyson Forrester, you know, makes the team. You can't put him higher than the second line to start him as a rookie. That would be silly. Right. I, I think so, too. And so, you know, I, I think that looking at next year seems like there isn't going to be much change, despite the fact we're talking about massive change in the organization. But I think yeah. at least for that top line, um, I, I don't see them kind of going outside of that box of Morgan Frost. Now, he's got a sign, too, but... Uh, I think, you know, having Morgan Frost center that top line for now is looking like what it will be next year. Now, if you want to look a little bit further in the future, uh, do you see anybody else in the system that has top line potential? I mean, they're going to hope that Karagoche does. And and I still think that's a bit of a reach at center. Right. As a winger, I think he could be a top liner. But at center is a different different conversation so no i don't think anybody else is battling for that now maybe somebody they get in this year's draft would and and that's you know a different conversation right i i think that it seems like if the flyers did what was in their best interest they would draft a forward in this upcoming draft in in for that first yeah. round pick and well, that's and, where the strength is too so it kind of would be odd if they didn't right there's right, no, and there's not a lot of strength in defense. There's a, there's a fair amount of depth, but it's not the strength of the draft. Exactly. So hopefully, a top ten pick would be a first line caliber talent in uh, the we'll find NHL. That out later. I there's, know, I know. It's always it. That's why it's a draft, and there's always risk. And there's no. I meant even closer than that. I I saw I peeked ahead at the question. So well, uh, I. I peeked ah. into the mailbag, Rachel. All right. Well, that ready. is something we will be getting to in our next segment. Uh, but I, I do think that looking forward, if we, I'm very interested to see what happens with Cutter Gatti, to your point. Like, are they going to put him into this center box, uh, much like they did with Noah Cates? Like, Cates had had, I think, the four years of college experience to be able to make yeah. that transition a little better. But if Cutter Gautier only plays two years at the college level, and my guess is that he'll stay on wing a little bit more, I just don't know that that transition is going to be as easy for him. No, I and... agree. Even after two years, if it's solid, if he's coming in right away, Torts might say, go to the wing and, you know, may never go off of that. Like, but that's, that may be his path to the NHL quicker. So they may accept it. Now, if he wasn't quite ready and you made him an AHL center for a year, I wouldn't have any problem with that. I know some fans would probably grumble, but again, not everybody picks up, you know, the thing about the center position is this, um, the reason like Pierre-Luc Dubois was able to pick it up in a season and in, in one, you know, one CHL off season is simply because of his physical nature. And and he is super strong, this kid. Gauthier is not built like Pierre-Luc Dubois. He's just not. Yeah. So I, I do think that if Carter Gauthier has a chance at being a top liner, it's going to be on the wing. And if they want him playing for the Flyers sooner, that's what it's going to have to be. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, I think, yeah, obviously that's a conversation for 
two years from now, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I think it's important to think about those things when you're trying to build the roster for next season and yeah, what the lines are going to like. You these things out a little bit and have your your hopes and whatever. And that's something that Danny has to kind of do on his own because Torts doesn't really care more than, a, right. you know, what's ahead of him. He just cares what's sitting there now. So, you know, you do it on your own. Yeah. So maybe three years from now, we're looking at a top line that has this year's number one draft pick, Cutter Gautier and Morgan Frost at center. Possible. Very possible. So uh, can't, you know, look too far into the future without some information, but it's no. always good to think about it. It is. All right. Uh, much like Russ talked about, we will be getting to your mailbag questions coming up next. All right. So we're going to go back to a question from Brandon that we talked about last week. He was asking about guys that, you know, in the system that will turn pro next year. And we kind of focused on the players that would likely or could end up on the flyers and what their potential was there. He really wanted to know who's going to come in and definitely play for the Phantoms and what that could do for them. So uh, what do you think about, you know, future Phantoms, Russ? Well, we talked about J.R. Avon. He was certainly a uh, yeah. fun guy that could come in and do that. I have to sort of vet this in my mind. I haven't really thought about this, so it's not like something that is front front of mind for me. Um I, I mean, I do there. think that Emil Andre is going to start off. Well, he's going to start. Phantoms. I mean, he's already there. So anybody who's yeah. already there, to me, is already there. So that's a no-brainer. Um, you know, it would be interesting. I think Ethan Sansom could. He turns mm -hmm. 20 uh, in August, and I think, that's, I think that's fine. I don't think that's the cutoff yet. August 23rd, it's close. Um, so he could could be a guy that might do it he's already had four years in the uh dub so i would look at him uh you kind of have to look at tuamala and at least give him that chance and see if he's gonna be that guy so i think tuamala gets that chance uh yeah i would with tuamala i think like this messing around in the European leagues. I mean, I understand what's been happening there, yeah. but I think ultimately like it's kind of a make or break situation and they have to, like, I think it would be better for the organization and for him if he came over and played for the Phantoms. Yeah. I mean, Zanetti age wise could, but I wouldn't do it. Millman. I definitely would. I need to know what I have in Mason Millman. So I would definitely have him there. That's probably the, the list right now. And, you know, and anybody they signed this year to, you know, a next year, you know, so, uh, Wolick, you know, he'll be around. And maybe I'm leaving out the other guy. I know the other one I think was only a part time from, from this year's college group that was an AHL deal. So, so mostly that's it. Yeah, I, I think so too. But I think with, uh, Tuamala and J.R. Avon are going to be the guys that they're they should be focusing on. Yeah. Sure. So next question. This is a good one. What's the latest the Flyers should have management in place to be in good shape for the draft? Doesn't really matter based on what Danny Briere answered to me that there's not going to be any changes at the table. So really, this director of hockey ops is going to have really nothing to do with the draft anyhow. So it doesn't matter, Rachel. It could be September 1st, but it won't be. Uh, you know, I think just throwing it out there, I think it should happen um, by middle of next month. But maybe it doesn't. Yeah, I think uh, it, re it really need like a good six weeks, right? I think. I mean, this person is not going to have any input. It's just if you want the organization to kind of look whole, sure. Then do it a few weeks before the draft for sure. Yeah, I think so. Uh, next question, draft related. Is there going to be a big difference between the seven and nine slot in the draft? Uh, this is me thinking, like, do the Flyers get bumped down because people below them move up? There is a big difference. Um, I think if they're picking at seven, there's still a chance 
at a top line center. And I think if they're picking at nine, it's a, it's a big maybe. And then you can get top, top liners still in other positions. And that's when you have to start thinking about that aspect of it. So, but I think at that point for like what we would call today guaranteed, I think they're a, a top line center. I think by nine, they're gone. Yeah, I, I think so too. I don't know why it feels that way, but just looking at all the various different lists and the players and especially, you know, considering what we've seen from U18 Worlds, which we're going to talk about on tomorrow's show, uh, yeah, I feel like there's like just this weird line at around seven or eight. Yeah, I mean, look, a guy like Matthew Wood, who's got a long um, trail ahead of him because he's the youngest guy in college hockey and he does play center, but he hasn't played center this year in college hockey. Sure, he could be a, a center possibly in five years and maybe, you know, in six years, a top line center. That's possible, but it's really hard to project that right now. So, like, he could be one of those guys. Riley Height, I don't think he will project as a as a top line center. So. I, I just don't see it. Right. I, I think, uh, yeah, we, we will get into a lot of those guys on tomorrow's show, but I do think that there's going to be a difference. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed with the ping pong balls. Yep. All right. Do you, you think that the Flyers <clears throat> are done with any type of signings until free agency opens? So that would include like ELCs and such, right? Yeah, it seems like they are. I mean, it really seems like, <clears throat> Excuse me. That that Torts has put put the clamps on on anything else, and that we're really just talking about waiting until free agency opens, and then maybe something on the back end of the August fifteenth when rights expire, college guys. <laughs> Excuse me. But other than that, it seems like they're done. And I don't know. Like I always think. There's guys to add. I know there's, I've talked about guys, so I'm not going to repeat myself, but um, they're just in this spot now where they feel like they need to subtract before they add. And that's the mantra coming from the coach and the coach has more power than most coaches in the league. So I'm just going with that. Yeah. I'm not sure there's anybody, you know, now that the Jay O'Brien situation is decided that, you know, you need to rush into an ELC right now. So I think that it's just a matter, again, of like booming the pieces around properly and making sure that the guys you want to be in North America or the guys that are going to transition that you've already signed have who are going to transition over from junior like Avon, like Ethan Sampson. You know, you have all those ducks in a row and have mm -hmm. decided like what you're going to do on those fronts yeah, I agree. Not necessarily signings. All right, last question from Michael. And sorry we didn't get to this last week. It just came in, I think, right after we recorded. But uh, do you wish the Flyers included a black variation for their upcoming new uniforms? Uh, Michael wants the old black jerseys from the early 2000s. Yeah, How do you feel about those? With some black in it, I, I'm kind of a fa in favor of. I always think that's a good change off, and it kind of looks good if you wear it. It hides some of the fat if you're a guy. So, yeah, I think I, I think I'm in favor of that. Yeah, I like I like the old black jerseys better than like the stadium series black jersey. Right. If that I makes agree. sense. Yeah. I think it needs that like white highlight to it that just black and orange isn't enough. Like right. even if you have that brighter orange, which I'm excited about the brighter orange. Um, we did talk about that. But yeah. um, I do like if there's like a third jersey. Um, I do hope they bring back that black one. I don't think I liked it at the time. I, I seem to recall, but I do like it now, like in retrospect. So I'm here for it. Yeah, maybe they'll put a gritty patch on the third jersey on the new one. <laughs> they will not. They'll put an ad on it before they do that. <laughs> All right, that will do it for today's show. Thanks for making us your first listen today and everyday listeners tomorrow on the show. We are going to check in on U18 Worlds, how all the different countries are doing and some individual players specific to the draft. We're going to dig a little deeper into uh, Matthew Wood, who's had an excellent tournament so far. 
As a reminder, we always want to hear from you. So send us in your mailbag questions at Lockdown Flyers or email us at lockdownflyers at gmail. I am Rachel. I'm on Twitter at rmiriam. That's R-M-I-R-I-A-M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S-P-O-R-T-S-O-L-O-G-Y. Have a great day.